Glory to God. Well, glad to be back to church. Glad to see all of you. Last Sunday I was preaching in Indiana, Indiana Police, and then I flew to Maryland that same Sunday and preached for uh, one of my sons, Dr. Chris, and then from his church, I went to Power City, Maryland. We had a great time. We had people travel all the way from New Jersey. People came from New York. People came from all of that area to fellowship with us at, uh, at Maryland. It was really an exciting time to fellowship with the brethren, you know, and to see a lot of them since after the lockdown and after all the COVID things. And it was just a joy to see that the world is opening up. People are flying all over the place and life has begun again. And I'm glad to be here. Thank you for all your prayers. I was part of the prayers through the week and everybody who came for the prayers, you know, we're expecting great things as the 30 days of glory begin next Sunday. But it's just a joy to know that we serve a God who guarantees us answers to prayer. Are we not excited about that? Praise God. So I appreciate all of you who were here for the prayer time and the, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man make a tremendous power available that is dynamic in its workings. Praise God. All right, so we're concluding the series on reflecting the Father. Reflecting the Father. The book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse number 18. Matthew, chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Next verse. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So we took time to look at, you know, fundamentally, where the fatherhood of God began from, and we traveled from Genesis down. We've examined Abraham, we've examined Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. We have looked at scriptures in the light of Christ, and we've laid quite some groundwork. If you are not here for all of the services, get the materials, especially even this morning service, the first service. Those materials will help you to be up to speed with what we are teaching and where we are in this series of teaching that the Holy Spirit will have us have as a church. Now, remember that Abraham was a prophet. In the first service, I established that the Bible wants you to know Abraham's character as a prophet, not just a businessman. And Abraham, being a prophet, foresaw and spoke the things he foresaw and acted the things he foresaw. David was also a prophet. And David spoke the things he foresaw and acted the things he foresaw. For example, the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 29. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 verse number 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. That he is both dead and buried. And his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Next verse. Therefore, being a prophet. So David was a prophet. Abraham was a prophet. Being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him. That of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he will raise up Jesus or Christ to sit on his throne. Next verse. Next verse. He seen this before. He saw this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Neither his flesh did see corruption. So brother Paul will write concerning how the prophecies of the Old Testament were made manifest or how they were spoken. Look at the book of Galatians chapter 3 verse 8. Galatians chapter 3 verse 8. Brother Paul says, And the scripture foreseen that God will justify the heathen through faith. Preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So when God said to Abraham, I will bless you and I will make you a blessing, that was God's intention and that was God communicating the facts of the gospel to Abraham. God preached the gospel and we took time to do exegesis on that in the promise of God. Now we took time to establish that God was going to be the one to provide. The Lord shall provide himself. That he is the almighty, the all-sufficient. The double-breasted God who does not need help from anybody. 
but rather is capable of helping everybody and much more. We also establish that God, therefore, if he is the almighty God, Shate, which means I will be Yahweh or I am sufficient. So if he is sufficient, it means he is sufficient to be the light of the world. It also means he is sufficient to be the seed of the woman in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. So we establish that Isaac and Abraham or Abraham and Isaac are vessels by which the word of the Lord was communicated. Abraham and Isaac are vessels. So something we have established about the fatherhood of God is that God will not demand a sacrifice from you to help you. He will rather be the sacrifice to help you. He is the Ezar, the help meet for man. He is the one that rescues man out of trouble. So he does not demand, he supplies. He does not ask for, he gives. He does not request for, he offers himself as the lamb, as the animal that will die in the place of man because his entire intent is to bring help to man. So we said in the fatherhood of God, the fatherhood of God therefore provides the sacrifice. So like we said, just like David, David also spoke using a first person pronoun. And when he spoke those things, it sounded like he was talking about himself. But like the prophets of the Old Testament, he wasn't talking about himself. Rather, he was talking about someone else. It's the indication narrative. You find that it happened to David, it happened to Abraham. You know, in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 11. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 11, examining David. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. If your Bible was mine, I will underline the word an house. The word and house means a family because we are tracing the fatherhood of God. A family. Look at that second Samuel chapter 7 verse 12. And house or a family. Second Samuel 7 12. And when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. The word set up is the Hebrew word gom, Q-U-M. It means to raise, like raise up from the dead. I will set up, I will raise. Look at that 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 13. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 13. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Is that Solomon? Huh? Is he talking about Solomon? No, he's not talking about Solomon. Now, when David was teaching the children of Israel, which books was he reading? Genesis to Deuteronomy. He was teaching them from Genesis to Deuteronomy. So, could David have heard the promise that was made to Abraham? Yeah. And Abraham meets his own father means God kept his word what he had promised Abraham God kept it alive when you hear the word new covenant it's not a replacement of the old covenant the word new covenant is not a replacement of the old covenant this is the new covenant means God kept his covenant new God kept his covenant new or God kept his covenant fresh or God didn't change his covenant. New covenant is not a replacement of the old. It simply means God kept his covenant new or fresh. The word new covenant means that God said he will do, he kept it and he did it. That God said he will do, he kept it and he did it. He kept his covenant new. He kept his covenant fresh. That's the meaning of new covenant. So David is talking about someone else. Just like Abraham was talking about someone else. Isaac speaks of someone else. Isaac. 
So they were talking about someone else. Remember the conversation in Acts chapter 8 between the eunuch and Philip. He said, who is this prophet talking about? Is he talking about himself or of some other man? Because all the prophets of the Old Testament spoke as if they were speaking for themselves, but actually they were speaking for someone else. Who was he talking about himself or some other person? And then he got helped. Beginning at the same scripture, he preached unto him Jesus, which means he went back to Genesis and took him through and said this is about someone else everyone was talking about someone else that's why the focus of the scripture was not on the personalities the focus of the scriptures is on jesus because the personalities are vessels they are sufficient enough to get us to the perfect vessel they are sufficient enough personalities to get us to the perfect vessel. The characters of the Old Testament were sufficient enough to get us to the perfect vessel. Talking about Christ himself. Just like Moses. Moses also talked about somebody else. Moses spoke about someone else. If Jesus speaks about someone else, then he is not the Christ. If Jesus speaks about someone else, then he is not the Christ. Moses spoke about someone else. Isaiah spoke about someone else. Abraham spoke about someone else. Isaac spoke about someone else. But Jesus did not speak about someone else. If Jesus had spoken about someone else, then he is not the Christ. You know, sometimes the Muslims... They miss Jesus' teaching on the Allos Paracletos. The Muslims. When they hear about the Allos Paracletos, another comforter, they say that that another comforter is Muhammad. That Isa is the prophet. That Jesus is a prophet who spoke about another that was coming. And they say the another that was coming is Prophet Muhammad. Prophet, Prophet Muhammad is the comforter. <laughs> How is Muhammad a comforter? A man who died not knowing where he's going and begs all his followers to pray for him. That's why all the followers of Muhammad, before they call his name, they will say a prayer. May God have mercy on Prophet. That is, Prophet Muhammad is not sure of mercy. He's not sure of where he's going. And he is comforter. Where is comfort in that? A man is not sure of where he's going. How is that a comfort? They don't call his name till they say a prayer. Because the man doesn't know where he's going. And the Quran says, the Quran says, it's written in black and white, that Jesus will judge the world. So if Jesus will judge the world and prophet Muhammad is not sure of where he's going, if I was them, I will take sides with the one that will judge the world. Won't you take sides with one another? <laughs> Jesus emphatically said he's not a prophet. He emphatically said, I'm not a prophet. In Matthew chapter 16 verse 13. Look at it. Matthew chapter 16 verse 13. And um, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesar at Philippi. He asked his disciples saying. Who do men say that I the son of man am? Next verse. And uh, they said some say that thou art John the Baptist prophet. Is that a prophet? John the Baptist is he a prophet? Some say Elias. Elijah is he a prophet? Some say and others, Jeremiah. Jeremiah is he a prophet? Or one of the prophets? Next verse. He saith unto them, If people think I'm a prophet, you, whom say ye that I am? Because I'm not a prophet. I'm not one of them prophets. I'm the one the prophets were prophesying about. I am the termination of their prophecies. I am the destination of their unction. And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, 
the Christos, the anointed one, and his anointing, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Bajona. This does not come by flesh and blood, this comes by revelation. I'm not a prophet. I am the Christ, the Son. I am God become a man. Son means God taking on humanity. I am the Son of the living God. I know some Christians struggle to defend it because they cannot explain the, the, the allos paracletos. They can't explain the another comforter. If Jesus speaks of someone else, then he is not Yahweh. If someone else will come to do the work, then Jesus is not Yahweh. If someone else will be involved in it, then he is not Yahweh. If anyone will have to send someone who is not him, or speak of someone who is not him to do the work, then it's not the Yahweh that we read of. Because the Yahweh is the I am that I am. And I will be what I will be. He is almighty. The one that supplies what they will need. So look at what Moses says about Jesus. In Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren. Like unto me. Unto him you shall hearken. Unto him you shall hearken. According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. So Moses said the Lord will raise. That word raise is the word guam in the Hebrew. Q-U-M. It means being raised from the dead. Being raised from the dead. He will raise, he will raise him. Him shall you hear. The one that will be raised from the dead. Him shall you hearken unto. Deuteronomy 18, 18. Deuteronomy 18, 18. I will raise the word kum. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee. And will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. This is interesting because Moses had already ordained Joshua. Joshua will take them to Canaan. So when Moses was talking about raising another, he wasn't talking about Joshua. Just like Abraham. Just like David. He is speaking about the sea. He will raise up. Raise up from the dead. So, the prophet Isaiah is also prophesying about is the servant. His servant. But he says, this servant is rejected of men. This servant will bear the iniquities of us all. Then Isaiah said, I am not this servant. There is a servant that will bear the iniquities of all. He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him by his stripes. We are healed. Isaiah cannot say that about himself because he is from a wealthy family. And Isaiah was dressing well. But look at what he says of Jesus. Isaiah 53 verse 2. Isaiah 53 verse number 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of a dry ground. He had no form. No comeliness. And when we shall see him. There is no beauty in him. That we should desire him. Isaiah describing. Who this servant is. It cannot be Isaiah. Because Isaiah. Didn't fall into any of these adjectives. So when we read this prophet of God. We need to know. That they are spokespersons. The prophets were spokespersons. And if you know what a spokesperson does, a spokesperson, we call him like a publicity secretary. 
of an organization who comes to address you on behalf of another. A spokesperson speaks about what someone else will do. So both Moses, Abraham was a prophet. What about Isaac? What about Isaac? He was a prophet also. What about Moses? What about David? So they are spokesperson. Let's look at someone else by the name Solomon. Solomon. In, in Proverbs chapter 1. Now before we read. Listen carefully. Everybody look up, look up, look up. In the history of the scriptures. Solomon was arguably one of the wealthiest. Actually the wealthiest that has ever been in scripture. Solomon. So there's this idea of reading his words like the counsel of a rich man who wants you to be wealthy. And that's how many people approach the counsel of Solomon. How comes no one else was that wealthy? From when Solomon was teaching it. If what he was teaching were principles of economic wealth, how comes no one else was wealthy like him all through his time? Because that's not what he was teaching. And you know, uh, people believe that his books were written without proper interpretation, but that's not correct. Solomon is a prophet. Nabi. N-A-B-I. <laughs> Solomon is God's spokesperson. That needs to be settled. Solomon spoke as a prophet. As a spokesperson for God. And he will continue in the tradition of reiterating what God said that he will do. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse number 14. Pay attention. Deuteronomy 17 14. When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee and shall possess it. And shall dwell therein and shall say I will set a king over me like as all the nations that are about me. So which means that God is the king. But people will choose to have their own king. Israel will even choose to have its own king. Look at that Deuteronomy 17 verse 15. 17 15. Thou shalt, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee. Whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shall thou set king over thee. Thou mightest not set a stranger over thee which is not thy brother. Why is Moses saying this? Who is the king? God is the king. God says he is the servant king. God says he is the sacrificial serving king. God is the one that provides the king as himself. God is the one that provides the king as himself. But these guys got fed up with this promise. Then they said, we want a king like other nations. So Moses foresaw it. How could Moses accurately predict that Israel will reject God and look for a king? Because number one, he's a prophet. And number two, he knows Israel very well. He had been with them for 40 years. He knew the kind of request they are capable of making. So he said to them, if you are going to choose a king, make sure he is your brother. Why did he say so? Because the promise is to Abraham. Okay? Make sure he is your brother. So it will resemble what will happen eventually. Now this is not God endorsing them having a king. This is God accommodating them in his mercy and in his grace. He's not endorsing it, but he's accommodating it. So let's see something close to what we are talking about. Them having a king among their brethren. Is that the will of God? No. God is the brother who becomes a king over them as a servant. You didn't hear that. So let me go over it. God is the brother who becomes a king over them as a servant. 
God is the brother who becomes a king over them as a servant. But they don't want that kind of arrangement, at least not yet. So God accommodates what they want, walking through it to get to what they really need. He accommodates what they want, walking through it to get to what they really need. So the concept of kings in Israel did not come from God. The concept of choosing kings did not come from God. So Moses said, in case you decide to choose a king, which you will do, this is what you will do. Make sure he is your brother. Deuteronomy 17 verse 16. Please pay attention. Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse 16. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, you shall henceforth return no more that way. That means you will not have a military. Anybody you decide to be your king will be your brother. Number two, he will not have an army. He will not have a military. He will not multiply horses to himself. Because that's what the kings of the earth were doing. And God's kingdom is counterculture. That's what the kings of the earth were doing. You know, um, it didn't come from God. We saw it in Genesis 14 verse 7. The kings of the earth already had kingdoms. They had military power. And that didn't come from God. So oftentimes we think it is God that started, you know, the kingdoms and kings. And no, God only got involved in his mercy to help man. So God will walk through their kingdoms till we get to the perfect day. He will walk through their setting of kings, kingdoms till we get to the perfect day. Are we still here? Till we get to the perfect day. Deuteronomy 17, 17. Stay with me. Deuteronomy 17, 17. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. That is the king you will appoint for yourselves. Just like Jesus, he had no military. He had no silver and gold. Jesus was not wealthy. He didn't multiply influence and affluence. That is not his kingdom. Look at that Deuteronomy 17, 18 now. Verse 18. <clears throat> and it shall be when he seated upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priest and Levites, a copy of the law. Does that include Genesis? Huh? Yes. That means he shall have the word. The king that you will appoint will have the word. He will have no military and he will be one of your brothers and he will not multiply wives and he will not take you back to Egypt. At least it will be something close to what God will do eventually. Are we still in the building? So now, look at that Deuteronomy 17 verse 19 and 20. Deuteronomy 17. And it shall be with him and he shall read therein all the days of his life. That he may learn to fear the Lord his God. To keep all the words of this law and the statutes to do them. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. And that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left. To the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. That means he is not a ruling king. He is a serving king. The king will not be a ruling king. He shall be a serving king. Which is the exact opposite of the kings of the nations of that time. So which means that Solomon is teaching the law. Solomon is teaching the law. Solomon is a teacher of the law and also a prophet of God. So now, let's see how Solomon was teaching the law. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 6. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 6. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark saying. 
The word proverb is the Hebrew word marshal. M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L for those making notes. Marshal in the Hebrew. The word proverb, marshal, means illustration. Illustration. So, this is Solomon. He is about to teach the children of Israel what book will he have before him? Huh? What book will Solomon have to teach the children of Israel from? Genesis to Deuteronomy. Genesis to Deuteronomy. Because that's the only book that was available. So Pro Je Solomon now is going to teach because Solomon is a prophet and he's a teacher of the law. He's about to teach Israel from Genesis to Deuteronomy. That means the book of Proverbs will be the illustration of the things that are already written in Genesis to Deuteronomy. The book of Proverbs is a book of illustrations of the things that are already written in Genesis to Deuteronomy. Can we say therefore that the book of Proverbs are the illustrations of God's purpose and plan? Can we say that the book of Proverbs are the illustration of God's promise? The promise God made to Abraham. Huh? The promise God made to Isaac. The promise God made to Jacob. To the children of Israel. If you are here, say I hear you. Alright now. So that means therefore that that book of Proverbs will be the illustration of God's promise. One more word. Proverbs 1 6. Proverbs chapter 1 verse number 6. Stay with me. Proverbs 1 6. Who is on the computer? To understand a proverb and the interpretation. The words of the wise and their dark sins. The word illust I mean interpretation. We saw the word proverb illustration. The word interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The word dark sayings is the Hebrew word chida. Chida. Dark sayings. Chida. It means complex questions. Complex questions. Now, let me ask you a question. Who has complex questions? God or man? Man. Alright? Complex questions. Where did we find these questions? Where did we find these complex questions? Huh? Huh? Genesis to Malachi. Or we can say among the children of Israel. The complex questions were among the children of Israel who had Genesis to Malachi. So the questions they were asking were about what? Hello? The questions the children of Israel were asking were about what? The promise of God. They were asking questions about the promise that God made to Abraham. God made to Isaac, to Jacob, their fathers. When will this promise come to pass? So, there were questions about God's promise. So, because they were asking these questions, were there questions positive or negative? What kind of questions were they asking? <laughs> So we see that they could not enter in eh? Eh? because of what? So what, what kind of questions will they be asking? Questions of unbelief. This promise that God even made said, when will it happen? Will it happen? <laughs> will it happen? They were asking questions of unbelief. So what will the teacher do? The teacher will now use illustrations. Hello? The teacher will now use what? Illustrations. Let's say he will use common experiences. Or let's say he will use natural things to explain what? Spiritual things. He will use natural things to explain spiritual things. So let me ask you again. So I'm sure you're following me. Who is the teacher we're talking about? Solomon. So, Solomon is before Israel. One more word. The interpretation is the Hebrew word melitza. 
Melita. Those of you making notes, M E L I T M E L I T S A H. I mean S A H. Melita. It's used for a poem, a poetic word or a satire. So that means the book of Proverbs is poetic. The book of Proverbs is poetic. It's written like a poem. So you will see Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 now. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7. Put it up for me. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord. So what is the key to understanding the book of Proverbs? Huh? The fear of the Lord. It's not the want for wealth, but the fear of the Lord. You didn't hear that? To understand the book of Proverbs, it's not the want for wealth. It's the fear of the Lord. So, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of this knowledge. Which knowledge? The knowledge of the promise. So, can we call it faith? Faith where? Faith in the promise of God or faith in God. So, to unlock the meaning of Proverbs, it will require faith in God or faith in God's promise. To unlock the book of Proverbs. Now, so Israel is before Solomon according to Deuteronomy 17. He had Genesis to Deuteronomy as a book to teach Israel from. So, he's about to teach them and we saw that prophet spoke on behalf of who? God. God's spokesman. So, they might use words that they got directly from the mouth of God. So, this is a prophet and he's talking to the children of Israel. The children of Power City. The children of Exodus 4.22. Exodus chapter 4 verse 22. Put it up. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son. Who is my son? Israel is my son. Even my firstborn. Uh, 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 yeah. Israel is my son even my firstborn what book is Solomon teaching from Genesis to Deuteronomy Israel is my son so who address Israel as my son huh? Huh? so who is God's son Eh? God. Who said Israel is my son? God. Who, whose son is Israel? Eh? God. Okay. Who is Israel's father? Who is God's son? Is Bible study. Who is Israel's father? Who is God's son? Father and son. The fatherhood of God. So now Moses communicated this in the in the five books, and Solomon is teaching Israel. And Israel is what? God's son. And God is Israel's what? Father. Very, very good. Very, very good. Now, Proverbs 1.8. My son. Huh? My son. Hear the instruction of thy father. And forsake not the law of thy mother. Is this Solomon talking or the father God? Talking to who? To his son who? But there's mother. 
<laughs> Is God not a mother? Will a mother forsake a sucking child? Even if she does, I will not. Meaning I am also a mother. So forsake not the word of your father, nor the instruction of your mother. What God is saying to Israel is, don't forsake what I have told you. We are in Genesis to Deuteronomy. Who is teaching? Solomon. Who is he teaching? Israel. About who? Their father. Using what? Illustration. And what style of writing? Poems. Am I teaching? Stay with me. Now. So he said like a mother over the children of Israel. He said like a father. Here is instruction. Look at verse 9 and 10 of Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs 1, 9 and 10. For there shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Verse 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. This is God talking through Solomon to who? Israel. So there are spiritual instructions using the medium of everyday communication. That's the book of Proverbs. Spiritual instruction using the medium of everyday communication. So which means the book of Proverbs is the book of spiritual growth. The book of Proverbs is the book of spiritual growth. So when he says, my son, is he talking to one person or the nation? The nation. Look at Hebrews 12 verse 5. Please pay attention. Hebrews chapter 12 verse number 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Next verse. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Well, I have taught you that that word scourgeth is not in the original. And we can go back to where the writer of Hebrews was quoting from. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. Next verse. For whom the Lord loveth, he corrected, even as a father the son in whom he delighted. So the word cogit is not in Proverbs, which means it shouldn't have appeared in Hebrews. The word coach there is not even in the original. So can you see what we are saying here? Solomon speaks on behalf of God as a prophet of God. In Proverbs 12 verse 5, that word there, that word chastening in there is the same word for pay the eye in the Greek. It means to train up a child. The same Greek word in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for instruction in righteousness. Instruction in righteousness. The word instruction in righteousness, which means to raise up a child by the way of the mouth. That is the same word in Proverbs 22 verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22 6. To train up a child means to raise up a child by instructions, by the way of the mouth. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4, talking to fathers. Fathers, provoke not your children, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So, when we therefore read Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1 to 3, why will Moses ask everybody to honor father and mother? What about those who don't have father and mother? And what about those who never saw their father and mother? So when he says honor, in the land, who is their father and mother? God. 
How are they meant to honor their father and mother who is God? By loving their neighbor. So when you love your neighbor, you're honoring your father and mother. See that? Love your neighbor. That's God's instruction. And who is your neighbor? Anybody close to you who needs help. And Paul is saying, yeah, this is the first commandment with a promise. So he therefore instructs their fathers to mirror the heavenly father. Fathers, provoke not your children. That means we see our actions towards our parents as a reflection of how we honor God. The way we treat our parents is a reflection of how we honor God who is our ultimate father. So Hebrews chapter 12, does it mean that Israel was born again? No. He says he speaks to them as unto children. Why? Because this is God's promise. God wants a family through Israel. So just like the gospel that we preach, every time he says, my son, he is making a proposal to Israel. Because they were not born again. So he called them my son by faith, making his intention known to father them. When you go to preach, you tell people your sins are already forgiven. That's the gospel. Then the person says, I believe. Then what happened? It is effected. When you say your sins are forgiven, has not yet happened to him. You are making a proposal. So the preaching of the gospel is making God's proposal known to men that God has already gone ahead to reconcile you to himself. And if you accept it now, you experience it. That's why it's called the ministry of reconciliation. That God is not holding man accountable for sin. That God has already forgiven man in Christ. And all man is required to do is to accept what God has done. Am I teaching here? I said, am I teaching here? One of my videos went viral and I think it's still trending. Where I said sin cannot take a man to hell. I like such things. I like such things. Because they make people talk. And when people start talking about something, it is easy for the Holy Ghost to bring them to the truth. Sin don't, can't take a man to hell. Jesus died for sin. If Jesus died for sin and sin takes a man to hell, then the death is useless. Are you following? The death is useless. What was the death for? For sin. Did he die? He fainted? He died? He really died? He was buried? And when he rose, did he rise with sin? What happened to sin? He put an end to it. And he rose. Triumphant. And made man an offer of righteousness. So what takes a man to hell? The rejection of what Jesus has done. He that believeth not is condemned that whosoever believe shall not perish. Not whoever confesses sin. Whoever, it is not confessing sin that saves. It is faith in Christ. I'm teaching good here. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away did he take it away? The sins of the church or the sins of the world? He took care of 
of sin. By the sacrifice of himself. Jakota Mahata. Romans chapter 4 verse 25. Put it up for me. Let's have some church here. Romans chapter 4 verse 25. Who was delivered for what? And was raised again for what? In his death, he put an end to offenses. 2 Corinthians 5.18 And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Next verse. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Unto himself. Reconciling the world unto himself. Re you are not seeing. You are not seeing. Reconciling the world. Not the church. The world. Unto himself. Put it up. Not imputing. Put that scripture up. Not imputing their not imputing to the sinner. That is God is not holding the sinner accountable for sin. That's why sin can't take a man to hell. Because even the sinner, God is not holding him accountable for sin. Why? He held Jesus accountable. The word impute is the word logizoma. It's an accounting term. No double entry. No double entry. Jesus did the single entry that was required. And in that single entry, the entire world taken care of. So men have been released from the hook of sin. But it can only be effected by faith in Christ. Is it clear? So when you see them talking, you can help them. Some of them that talk about those things, religion has finished them. So they can't see. You see? They can't see. You see? <laughs> Glory Glory to God. Hey. So God is making a proposal. He is making a proposal, a promise. He is making a commitment. He is keeping his covenant alive. The new covenant. So what we must watch out for is Israel's response. As for God, he keeps repeating his commitment. He keeps repeating his promise. He keeps keeping his covenant alive. So here is the writer of Hebrews. Hebrews 12 verse 7. Hebrews chapter 12 verse number 7. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Verse 8, verse 8, verse 8. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Then are you bastards. Listen carefully. If you can take the correction that means you are a son. If you can take the correction, that means you are a son. Israel as a nation, did they reject the chastening of the Lord? Yes. So they turned out as bastards. Israel as a nation turned out as bastards. That word bastard is the Greek word notios. N-O-T-I-O-S. Notios. It means, please, this is key. It means to be born of a slave. To be born of a slave. Or to be born out of bondage. It is the exact opposite of being born by a free woman. What's the writer saying? It means, if you reject God's word, you are still in bondage. You are a bastard. You are still in bondage. So Israel came out of Egypt, but Egypt never came out of them. So God spoke to them as to sons. But they acted as bastards. Born of slaves. 
So we know God's children by their response to God's word. How do we know God's children? By their response to God's word. Anyone who cannot obey God's word is not God's son. It means he is born out of bondage. So that means the background of that statement is Israel. God treated them like sons. He gave a promise. He kept a, a new his covenant with Israel. But Israel acted like bastards. So the writer of Hebrews says, look, if you reject his word, you are acting like bastards. I like that bastards. It carries more weight than born of slaves. Bastards. Say, I'm not a bastard. Draw it. Say, I'm not a bastard. So you know what you're talking about. <laughs> Paul will say, you are mere men. Paul will say, you are canal. You don't have the spirit. Look at Galatians 4.22. Are you enjoying this? Galatians 4.22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons. The one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. Next verse. But he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Next verse. Quickly move. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai which gendered to bondage which is Agar. Next verse. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answered to Jerusalem which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem which is above is free which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travelest not, for the desolate had many more children than she with her and husband. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Next verse, next verse, next verse. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman but of the free. I thought somebody will shout glory. So he takes it to the law of the spirit of life and then talks about the flesh. So we are born of the spirit of God. We are sons. Now, so Hebrews 12, 8 and 9. Hebrews 12, 8 and 9. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in much subjection unto the father of spirits and live? So God in the Old Testament books was making a proposal to be a father of spirits. So physical fathers mirror it. Question. Did God start being father in the four gospels? Did God start being father in the epistles? When did he start being father? He has always been father. He is a progenitor. He is a founder of a new humanity. Yeah, 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 yeah. He is the founder of a new creation. He is the example of a new creation. And on Mount Moriah, he is the one who makes the sacrifice. He is the one who stands in the gap. Matthew 5 48. Pay attention. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Be therefore perfect, even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. Mm. So here's Jesus teaching. Matthew 5 45. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. That you may be the children of your father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And send it rain on the just and on the unjust. So the word here is heaven. When we say your father in heaven. Listen, pay attention everybody. Can we also say your father who is in the spirit? Huh? Euphorinius. The Greek word for heaven. Euphorinius. 
immaterial spirit. So when we say, be therefore perfect, the word perfect there is the word teleos in the Greek, T-E-L-E-O-S. The word here means to reach the end or to come full circle to reach the end. Why does he say your heavenly father is perfect? Because you are going to see towards the end of the book where he forgave them. They know not what they do. That's the perfection of your father. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So is he the heavenly father? He is because of what he does. And what he does is perfect. Then he says, you therefore be perfect. Now, that text is taken from Leviticus chapter 11 verse 44. Leviticus 11 44. For I am the Lord your God, you shall therefore sanctify yourselves and be, you shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Next verse. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy for I am holy. The word kadosh. Kadosh in the Hebrew means be different. Because they came out of Egypt. So be different. Don't mirror the idols of Egypt. Mirror me. Be different. Let me be the father. Let me be the example. So don't mirror what you saw in Egypt. I am different. So mirror me. This is what he means by be perfect. For the Lord your God is perfect. Now look at the concluding statement. Leviticus 11.45 Leviticus 11.45 For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy for I am holy. So in his redemptive work in his salvation plan he says you see what I have done be ye like me. I am your heavenly father. I am the model. I am the example. I am the father of the new creation. So the heavenly father is what he did in Egypt. What did he do in Egypt? He brought them out. The heavenly father now culminates in what he did on the cross. He brought them out of Egypt which is a type of what he did on the cross. What makes him heavenly father? What he did on the cross. So why then did Jesus teach this? To show them that we should be different in this world. We don't take our examples from the world. We take our example from the heavenly father. The one who redeemed us and saved us. Are you here? Matthew chapter 5 verse 46 to 48. Look at the distinction he is making. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be therefore perfect. Be therefore different. Even as your father which is in heaven is different. Look at the distinction. Be different. As your heavenly father is different. Somebody say very loud, as a father is, so am I. Say it again very, very loud. One more time. Now say it very loud, I am just like my father. Matthew chapter 6 verse 7 and 8. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6 verse 7. But when you pray, use not vain reputations as the hidden do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Verse 8. Be not therefore like unto them. For your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. People assume that he means before you ask for a job, he knows. Before you ask for a wife, he knows. Before you ask for a car, your father knows. Before you ask for a puff and tea, your father knows. Your heavenly father knows. <laughs> Materialistic things disturb the church too much. You cannot base God's will on your desires. 
He knows what you need. He is the all-sufficient one. When you read Genesis 22, you will know what he means by what he knows you need. <laughs> we see the wood, we see the fire. Where is the sacrifice? The Lord shall provide himself. What does the Lord know you need? Salvation. And what has he provided? Salvation. If you need food, don't disturb your father in heaven. There are people around that will give you food. I'm teaching. Am I teaching? He's the all-sufficient one. So after this man, I pray. Jesus is not giving you prayer points. Our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. No, no, those are not prayer points. That's a revelation of the father's character so that you can copy. That your father is in heaven different from fathers on earth. Heaven and earth is to distinguish men from God. Our father which is in heaven not like my father in Orukanam. Because my father on earth will only respond to me based on performance. If you pass exam, I will buy you bicycle. That's our father on earth. Is that not true? If you behave well, I will take you for shopping. Okay? Every morning, clean your room, sweep everywhere. If you do it well, I will buy you, I will buy you a gift. That's my father on earth. My father in heaven doesn't have to do all that. My father in heaven does not wait for my performance to do what he wants to do. He does it and offers me. God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners. So he died and made an offer. See, let me be your father. Take. It's not behave well. Take. Eh, 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 eh. Not of works. It's a gift of God. Our father in heaven. Making a distinction. You need to understand what he is saying. We need to have a community reading of scripture. Don't read just the Lord's prayer. Read the chapter before and the chapter after. That's what we mean by community reading. <laughs> it's not that the community will gather to read. <laughs> I have to explain that. Before you say, okay, Papa say community reading. I would like to get out of the community. <laughs> community reading means to read the, the context by looking at the pretext and the posttext, all the two chapters. Okay, now, so you must know chapter 6 was about his kingdom. Before he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Look at the background of that. He says, what do the hidden think they need? Food, clothes, what to eat, what to wear, drinks. Then he says, it's not life more than food. Life is more than clothes. You didn't pray for life he gave you. Why do you have to pray for clothes? You didn't pray for life he gave you. Why do you have to pray for food? Food. You have life and food is your prayer point. Something is wrong with your mandula blangata. Is life not more than food? Is life not more than clothes? You didn't ask for life, you have life. You don't have to pray for food. You don't have to pray for clothes. Just get out and look for something to do. You will make money and eat. I will say, oh, uh, Papa, I, I'm a graduate. I have my degree but no job. Go to Moto Park. Carry wheelbarrow. Between now and 6 o'clock, you will have some thousands in your hands. Just carry wheelbarrow in Moto Park. As people are coming out of cars, tell them, I want to help you quickly. Uh, collect their box, put in there. 500, 200, 500, 200. Within a few hours, you will have money to eat and wear. Laziness is your problem. It's not your father ever. <laughs> Those are not the things to discuss your, disturb your father. The hidden, that is what the unbelievers pursue. That's not what you should pursue. There's a difference between Father in heaven and Father on earth. 
So there's a difference between believer in Christ and unbeliever. Unbeliever seek for food and clothes. The believer does not seek for food and clothes. The believer seeks for revelation, knowledge of what God has done in him. I'm teaching here. Somebody say, but, but you know, we need, we, need, we need the government to sit up and give us good roads. Yes, of course. We need the government to sit up and give us good cars. Yes, of course. But if that is all your Christianity about clothes and food and good roads and good cars, that means the day Nigerian government gives us good roads, good cars, give every citizen of Nigeria salary every month. Whether you work or not, you have a salary. And it's possible. That means the day the Nigerian government gives us roads and food and houses, as every citizen, you have a house, you have a car, you have a job, and you're comfortable. You won't need God anymore. So if your Christianity is, is around things, the government of nations will take care of that. That means you don't need God. So that's why it should not be based on what to wear, what to eat, what to drive. That is what the Gentiles seek. You, there are higher things than that. I'm teaching good. That's why some people, when they leave this country and go abroad, and they get into good societies, and they, they become citizens of another country, and they come under their social welfare, they don't go to church again. They don't need God anymore. Because before, the reason why they needed God was because of poverty situation. So because of poverty, they say, oh God, wherever you are, you must be somewhere. Oh God, you must be somewhere. Come to my aid. I need a car. I need a house. I need food. I need money. Oh God, come to my aid. So all of your God is a stomach God. So that's why some believers, when they go abroad, they don't go to church. They don't care about God anymore. They don't care. As far as they are concerned, if God likes, let him be there. If God doesn't like, let him not be there. There's more. Your father will give you much more. What does the father give? He gives much more. What is much more? What money cannot buy. Hallelujah. What money cannot buy. What, what money cannot afford. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. No. You forgive us so that we will forgive. You forgive us so that we will forgive. They call it debt in the Bible because it was in their culture. When you owe, you are a servant. When you owe, something is missing. The language had developed so long, so they started using debts for sin. So by the time it got to us, years after, we thought sin is you owe God. He paid a debt he didn't owe. I owe a debt I couldn't pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. Now I can sing Amazing Grace. <laughs> I know you're in power voices. <laughs> but in the Old Testament, when you say sin, it means something is missing. It's not a debt. It means something is missing. It's used by hatchers. To be without. Like sickness. Not to be complete. Is the exact opposite of completeness. When we say somebody is in sin. It means something is missing in his life. Another word is avon. It means guilt and punishment. So the word used in the epistles and for gospel. Aphesis is the word to deliver from. To let my people go. Or to cleanse. So it says you forgive us our debts. So we forgive our debtors. It's not we forgive so you forgive. He's not copying us. We are copying him. You forgive so we forgive. We learn from you forgiveness. We forgive the way we see you forgive. Are we in the building? That's that prayer. Or that's that teaching of Jesus on the character of the father. Because the father is the example. So forgiveness of sins therefore plays a major role in the character of the father. Forgiveness of sins. It's a major major in God's character. Because he's the ancestor. He's the progenitor. He's the founder. And therefore this is the promise that he has made. And he has fulfilled through Christ. 
So the concept of calling God Heavenly Father takes us to Genesis. Where we have the redemptive plan of God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 to 3. How will God redeem mankind? By the spirit. Which means the work of God on earth is how he fathers us. How does God father us? He fathers us through the spirit. He fathers us through the spirit. Please pay attention. He guides us, instructs us, shows us the examples and enables us by his spirit. So when Jesus said, your will is done on earth as in heaven, he simply means walk in the spirit amongst men. Walk in the spirit. Or live and act from the spirit of God. God fathers us. We are in the spirit. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's money. A place to stay, to walk and to act. In my father's house. Household. I give you another comforter, the paracletos, who will abide with you for how long? Hello, ladies and gentlemen, how long does the Holy Ghost stay with you? When you got born again, what did you receive? What is the guarantee of your salvation? How long is he to stay with you? Will he ever leave you? No matter what happens, will he ever leave you? So the Holy Ghost is the guarantee for your salvation. He abides with you forever. The same father, the same helper, the same guide. We are in the spirit. He now lives in us. Hallelujah. I am what I am. I will be what I will be. And today he is the spirit living in our inside. So in the resurrection, we have the father the son, all of them in the spirit. In the resurrection, we have the father, the son, and all of them in the spirit. So when I have the spirit, the spirit is the father and the son. So now the kingdom is with us. God's kingdom and reign commences and walks through us. So what we saw the father do from the cross in the resurrection, he is now doing through us by the spirit. Say with me, I am like the father. I act like the father. I have his impulses. I have his actions. I have his DNA. He abides in me. I didn't hear a powerful amen. He carries his will through us on the earth. Say with me, I am an extension of the will of God on the earth to mankind. I didn't hear a good amen. So when men are looking for God's character, say when men are looking for God's character, they shouldn't look far. I am a reflection of my father's character because he lives on my inside. Amen. Behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called and now are we the sons of God it does not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when we shall see him we shall be as he is because as he is so are we in this world glory to God somebody shout I'm just like my father you are in this world, but you are not of this world. This world has nothing on us. Our character is formed from God. We are holy as the Lord our God is holy. Distinct and different. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. We have the Father's enablement. The kingdom is here. The will of God is being done through us. As the Father is, so are we. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. As the father is. So are we. Stand on your feet. That's all I got for you. As the father is. Stand on your feet. And just shout these words with me very loud. I am just like my father. I am legitimate. 
I'm a true son. I attend to his words. I incline my ear to his sayings. I receive correction. I walk in love. I walk in the spirit as the father is. I didn't hear a powerful amen. Turn to your neighbor say, neighbor, I'm a reflection of my father. His character is expressed through me. Amen. Are you blessed? Say, I forgive because the father forgives. Say, I learn forgiveness from the father. The way the father forgives is the way I forgive. He said, your sins and iniquities I will remember again no more. So I too, I do not remember the sins and iniquities of people I forgive. I'm just like my father. Just like my father. Only goodness is found in me. There's no evil in me. I do not plan evil for people. Because my father doesn't plan evil for people. Everywhere I find people needing help, I reach out to help them. I'm just like my father. I didn't hear a good amen. God's character is being formed in us. As we grow in the word and grow in the knowledge of his word, his life flows through us. Somebody shout hallelujah. Listen, friends, it's not a do and don't lifestyle. Do not do. Do not do. Thou shalt not die. No, 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 no. no. That one is for people that are still struggling as slaves. That kind of Christianity is for slaves. Don't do and do. It's for slaves. There are people that are still under school masters and tutors. We are sons. Sons of his love. And here in the kingdom is not a do and don't. We just look at the father. And as we keep looking, his character begins to reflect through us. We change effortlessly just by looking. Uh, we keep looking. We all with open face, beholding the glory of God as in a mirror, we are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. Glory to God. Are you enjoying this? Amen. All over the world I come across people. Oh, Dr. Damina, since I started listening to your teaching, I discovered things I was struggling with suddenly have just disappeared. My life is getting better by the day. Yeah, that's what it is. As we keep staying with the word of God. Keep staying with the word of God. I've come across people say, I couldn't read my Bible for one hour before, but now I listen to a teaching four, five hours a day and I'm not satisfied. I still want to sit down and listen more. Bible study becomes attractive when the revelation of Jesus opens up. People that they still push you around, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible, uh -uh, is legalism. When you come into the reality of Christ, you don't chase people to read. It is they that will be chasing the Bible. How many of you have discovered your love for the word of God has gone up the roof? How many of you have discovered? You can listen and listen and listen. Is that true? There are people that follow my teachings throughout the day on radio. They start with Radio Aquaibo. <laughs> 11 to 1. As they are finishing, they switch to XL FM. As they are finishing, they switch to Passion FM. As they are finishing, they come to Comfort. As they are finishing, they go to Inspiration. And they look for heritage. They are not tired. Why? I found your word. I ate them. They are the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. I thought somebody would shout glory. Amen. Lift your right hand. Father, I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice. Wherever you are hearing the sound of my voice this morning, revelation knowledge continues to grow big on your inside. In the name of Jesus, barriers terminated. Sickness and disease terminated. The hold of the enemy terminated. Whatever is not planted by God, rooted out, rooted out, rooted out, rooted out. In the name of Jesus. God's life flows through you. God's life reflects through you. God's glory and grace made manifest through you. In the name of Jesus. And throughout this week, you will enjoy the beauty of Jesus. You will spread the savor of his grace all over the world. Great grace is upon you. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Go ahead and celebrate the word with a shout in the middle. Glory! Amen. 
Next Sunday begins Soteria season 8. Glory to God. Next Sunday is going to be Soteria season 8. We start from first service and hey, it just goes till the end of July. The emphasis of the Holy Spirit in salvation. It's going to be exciting. Very exciting. Make sure you buy a big size exercise book. Hard copy that you can keep forever in your house. That your children's children will come and study from. Buy a big one. All these little, little book uh, uh, notes, they will soon miss in your house. Buy a hard cover. Big, the larger size. So that when you finish, you put volume one. Volume two. Volume three. You just pile it for your children's 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 children. 